I think there's still an enormous gap between large segments of the humanities and social sciences on the one hand and the sciences on the other. Uh, I think especially the parts of the humanities that have been influenced by postmodernism uh, that deny that there's any such thing as human nature or for that matter a real world that we can uh, where, where we can empirically test our uh, uh, hypotheses about how it works. Uh, I think that a lot of social science takes place on the assumption that uh, ideas and values and norms float in some layer disconnected from flesh and blood brains uh, and that, they, that culture begets culture with the human mind out of the loop. Uh, but I do see signs that that uh, that wall is being breached. Uh, I think increasingly we're seeing uh, people in the uh, humanities, especially younger generations, taking an interest in the cognitive sciences and brain sciences and evolutionary psychology. And likewise, social scientists no longer treating social phenomena as uh, completely autonomous or free-floating, but asking questions of how do minds networking with one another lead to these higher order phenomena that we call uh, culture or norms. I wouldn't want to think of the third culture as some club that uh, only certain people can belong to with certain kinds of training or who frequent the right circles. But I think any, uh, any person speaking to the public about issues of white concern should be broadly uh, educated in the sciences as well as in philosophy, social science, and the humanities. Uh, I think that Snow put his finger on a problem uh, that was <clears throat> true at the time and still true now, that it is perfectly acceptable to flaunt your ignorance of the sciences and still be taken seriously, though if you flaunted your ignorance of high culture, you'd be seen as some kind of uh, Philistine. I think one ought to be seen as a Philistine if one is completely ignorant uh, about of the major ideas and discoveries of science. Part of the problem is that some aspects of the humanities are self-destructing by their own uh, admission that the idea that there is a malaise in the academic humanities, that, uh, that no one knows what, what they're for, what they have to contribute, uh, has been expressed by many people from within the field, uh, and it's reflected in the loss of money and, and enrollment and prominence in the modern university. Uh, I, I think that, there, uh, that this is a, a tragedy if it continues, but I think it doesn't have to continue because I think that the humanities in conjunction with um, the rest of intellectual life, mm -hmm. including science and philosophy, uh, could shed enormous light on our, our uh, the human predicament. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that studies of the arts can be illuminated by what we know from psychology uh, and evolution and brain science on the mental faculties that are necessary to create and appreciate culture, that is, study of music can be enlightened by our understanding of auditory perception. The appreciation of uh, an analysis of art can be illuminated by what we know about color and depth and uh, uh, motion and ecological uh, uh, optics and uh, human evolution. I think moral philosophy can't take place without some understanding of moral psychology if for no other reason than to discount intuitions that we have in moral philosophy that might be products of uh, ancient emotional circuits. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that film studies could be illuminated by uh, understanding of human attention and visual cognition, and the, the list goes on. I think the science has changed in such a way that connections can be built now that may have been impossible to build in 1959. <clears throat> One of them being an, anal an understanding of, of deep history how did what we call culture uh, originate in, in prehistoric humans forming the, the first uh, civilizations and, and cultures? A second uh, source of new knowledge is the mental faculties that make art and culture possible, social cooperation, moral instincts, uh, creative faculties, power of language. And a third, uh, which is just beginning, would be the study of network dynamics of how one person originates an idea that becomes contagious enough that other people take it up until it becomes uh, epidemic in a society uh, as a way of bridging individual psychology with social phenomena. That is the phenomena that we call culture. 
art often uh, is voracious. It will use motifs from all aspects of culture, including science. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I wouldn't think of third culture as primarily that it's going to be the scientists that give the artists uh, uh, themes to explore and, yeah. and motifs yeah. to elaborate. Uh, certainly, there will be give and take in the sense that there is much about human life that uh, can't be discovered through, through science, but mm -hmm. the humanities have to be the originator of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. What were the themes in, um, uh, in Shakespeare's tragedies? What are the literary devices that he used? Uh, what exactly did the Impressionists do? That's something that a scientist isn't going to reconstruct from, from scratch. Mm -hmm. They'd be out of their depth. Uh, but it does define phenomena that scientists working in collaboration with uh, humanities scholars, I think, can illuminate. Uh, I think there's an enormous amount of, of work to be done and insight to be gained and, and excitement to be spread. Uh, so it's hard to predict what will uh, catch on. Uh, that's what the, the network theorists tell us, that it's often unpredictable when a certain phenomenon will proliferate. Uh, but I certainly hope so.